wanted to be able to get everybody together. Um, so by way of quick introductions, uh, my name is Tony Ronzio. I'm Deputy Director of the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future. Um, and we're talking about the housing study that's coming out tomorrow. Um, the um, study is a collaborative partnership between my office, Maine Housing, represented by Scott Thistle and Johnny Kurz, uh, Kurz Kurzveld. I haven't said it out loud yet, so I apologize for um, stumbling on it. Um, and uh, the Department of Economic and Community Development, represented by Victoria Foley, who's got a very nice um, of our, our new, the new tourism posters to be over her left shoulder. Um, and um, in my office is represented by Greg Payne, uh, the governor's senior housing advisor. And we also have Christiana Whitcomb here, who is representing HRAA, who is the consultant that did the report. And so um, purpose of this is I hope everybody has a copy of the executive summary and the report. We don't have a, a prepared presentation or anything for this conversation today. This is an opportunity for you, for everybody to see the report um, and ask some questions about what's in the report. Um, um, I will let everybody do some introductions, but uh, Christiana is here, you know, as, as one of the lead authors of the consultant can kind of go into the report itself. Johnny is the new director of research and planning at Maine Housing. So if you've got some, you know, um, Maine State housing data or um, information needs, he's here. Um, Greg is here as someone that really, uh, as we all know, participates in a lot of our state housing initiatives and can add some context. And again, um, in uh, Victoria's agency is the Department of Econ in DECD has the Office of Housing Opportunity. So if there's anything that comes in there, she can obviously help with some questions on that. So um, with that, I would like to ask um, Christiana, Johnny, um, and Greg to kind of just introduce themselves a little bit, um, and then we can kick it off into questions if that works for everybody. Great, Christiana, why don't you go first? Great. Hi everyone, I'm Christiana Whitcomb. Thanks for coming today. Um, I am a director at HR and Advisors. We are a real estate, economic development, and public policy consulting firm. Um, we work nationally on housing policy and housing analysis. And um, we have been leading this study in collaboration with folks that Tony mentioned really since January of 2023. Johnny, not sure we hear you. <laughs> I can help him if you guys want. I'll go over. Oh, maybe he'll join and come back. Greg, do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself while we're waiting for the main housing guys to come back? Anything? Oh, there you go, Johnny. Perfect. Okay. I'll just get rid of the headphones, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, so as Tony uh, alluded to, I am new at, at Maine Housing. I've been here about six weeks and uh, uh, my role is the Director of Planning and Research. So uh, this uh, report falls well within my wheelhouse, but I was not around for the, uh, the you know, the inception of it, but uh, I think I'm pretty up to date on where things are and I'm happy to answer questions. And I do work closely with Scott on the communications and as part of my role, so uh, yeah. And uh, good afternoon, my name is Greg Payne and I have been for about two years now serving as the governor's uh, senior advisor on housing policy. Prior to that, I worked for about 15 years uh, as a development officer at Avesta and running the State Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, and we're just really excited to have partnered with HRNA on this and, and get a kind of uh, immense amount of information that can help guide housing policy going forward. Um. Hey, so we're going to keep this pretty egalitarian. If anyone has a question or wants to, to get it started, feel free to use the hand raise feature or just the hand raise feature, um, however you want, and we'll open it up to, to the floor. So Nicole, Zara, Stephanie, Chris. No question. Oh, Zara, you're uh, first. You got, you got the hand raise up. Go ahead. I made it first. Great. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I mean, this is obviously a pretty um, staggering report um, in terms of the numbers being presented. Uh, so thank you for the work you put into compiling it. But um, in uh, 2019, the most recent kind of report I found on housing under production in Maine 
uh, an up for growth report had housing under production in Maine at 9,000 homes. Uh, I mean, this week we now have that number at 38,000 homes. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little on the record about how circumstances have changed in the last few years, uh, why that underproduction may have been exacerbated uh, since that number in 2019. Great. And um, yeah, there are different studies out there that have looked at housing need in Maine. Some of them use different methodologies and consider different parts of the market, such as the rental market or the overall housing market. This study considers the entire housing market, rental and home ownership, um, and it considers the need for homes both to support broader availability and affordability for Mainers now, and homes that would, would be needed to support additional workers to be able to fill open job positions in the state. So it's really an economic development-based approach. But to speak to your question about 2019, a lot of the um, sort of sudden in-migration that has happened in Maine has really occurred since the onset of the pandemic. And that has also been largely of households who make higher incomes than existing residents, which means they have had sort of a competitive edge in Maine's housing market. So that has had a pretty significant impact on the need for homes over the past three years. Thank you. John, you're up, go ahead. Hey, Tony, can I jump in real quick? Just um, for folks who are coming on as reporters, just can you just let uh, everybody know who you're with and where you're from? Oh, sure. Apologies. Um, I'm with the Bangor Daily News. All right, Sean, I see your hand up, man. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the time. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm with Spectrum News, and I just had two quick questions. Um, I was looking through the, uh, the uh, executive summary, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, statements about the needs and the situation that has been talked about before. Um, obviously not to this level of detail, of course, but the, the, the concepts have come up again. I'm just curious uh, from the report's authors, uh, was there anything about the data or what you discovered that surprised you this time around? What stood out? Is that directed at the state or at? at I'm Maine? sorry, it's, it's directed at any of the report's authors who want to comment on it. Greg, would you be able to, to talk a little bit about, you know, broadly about the, about that? Well, I, sure. I mean, obviously, the, the top line adding up kind of the historic underproduction along with the housing that we need to kind of meet our future economic population needs, that total is a daunting number. This is the first report of its kind to try to do this. I mean, typically, reports that have been done in the past are looking at the current housing stock only, current housing needs only, or or even probably more to the case, uh, a couple of years prior to. Um, this is the first one we've had done in Maine that is looking forward and is anticipating the kind of economic growth that I think we uh, are currently expecting. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's a it's daunting. It um, I think what it requires us to do is um, take kind of years at a time and do the work of understanding how year to year we can get from where we are now uh, to the number of housing units we're gonna need by 2030, according to the projections um, in this report that were supplied by the state economist and the Department of Labor. Thanks. Um, I just have one other question about the call to action uh, toward the end of, of, especially down toward the bottom, you're talking a lot about wanting to advise uh, local municipalities and give local municipalities information on how they can change things on a local level as far as policies and such. I'm curious, uh, are you also looking at any further changes on the state level? I mean, are, are you anticipating an LD2003 version 2.0 down the road or anything like that? Um, I would say at this moment, we have not gotten that far. I think at this moment, uh, you know, th this report really came out of the passage of LD 2003, which, as folks may know, included a requirement that the state establish statewide and regional housing production goals. So sort of step one in that process was commissioning this report to understand what our housing needs are. You know, we have to take it from here now that we understand these housing needs, both currently and looking forward. We have to take those and create goals with our colleagues at the legislature. 
uh, with municipalities and our partners on the ground who create housing. Um, that's what has to happen next uh, in this process. I think we're, we're not at a stage where we're actually contemplating a, a new version of LD 2003, certainly. So is it fair to say that going forward, you're expecting to see uh, uh, new changes being implemented more on the local level? Uh, certainly we hope so. I think one of the things I just want to call out is with LD 2003, in addition to some changes that were made to land use requirements. So for example, homeowners under that law have essentially the right to create an ADU on their property, so long as some basic requirements are met. Uh, that's an example. Um, you know, I think part of part of that process also involved funding to localities, and that funding is going out the door right now. I mean, one of the things we wanted to do is say, okay, here's some um, minimal changes that we think can help change conditions on the ground that'll allow the private market to create some of the housing that we need. That's what we did in LD 2003. But we also said, here is funding that's going to happen annually so that you at the local level can consider what sort of changes make sense for you based on local conditions, based on local barriers. Uh, we want to support that effort. And so there's a team at DECD that is providing technical assistance to localities, but also is now getting funding out the door to those localities to try to do some of this work. Um, and you know, we obviously will take this information and share it with municipalities and the legislature and try to understand uh, kind of the most productive way forward in establishing actual goals. And if I can just uh, uh, add something to the end of Greg, there is a, a list of all the participants in the study um, outlined in there as well. And you'll see um, input from the Maine Municipal Association, from realtors, from uh, general contractors, from a whole host of groups that have um, provided some input into the study. So um, th that the study is coming out was a much more collaborative process where the authors, but it took a lot of stakeholder work um, and stakeholder input to be able to get uh, get to its conclusions. So um, Chris, just hold on one sec. Stephanie, I think used the old fashioned hand raise a second ago to, to ask something. So I want to make sure I call on her. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Stephanie. I am with WGME. Um, my question is towards the study authors of if we don't build the recommended amount of houses um, by a certain year, what is the biggest threat that we're looking at here in Maine? So what you've been starting to see in Maine is sort of um, significantly increasing housing costs. The average Maine household now needs to make over $100,000 to afford the median home price in Maine, which is almost what it double what it was just a few years before the pandemic. Um, so you're really already see, starting to see the impact. You know, the impact for renters and especially low income renters has been felt for a long time as rents have um, exceeded what households can afford. But what you'll continue to see is growing affordability problems. What you also continue to see is growing challenges for main businesses to actually hire and retain workers, which we've already heard about from people that we've interviewed and we've seen through the significant number of job openings in the state that exceeds what the Department of Labor would consider to be sort of healthy labor market conditions. You know, without homes that are affordable um, to what those jobs pay, Mainers will have a hard time taking those jobs. People will have a hard time coming from out of state to take those jobs and actually sustain the businesses that Maine already has now, let alone any future economic growth. If I could just interject really quick. Um, I didn't mention, but my background is a, as an economist. And so I just wanted to say that Christiana and her team are, are right on in that kind of uh, forecasting where Maine is going and, and these needs. And that is... Uh, I think hearkening uh, back to Zara's question or someone uh, part of what is different about this study and that I think is really great is that they are thinking not just about the immediate housing need, but the labor market needs and how that kind of feeds into there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem of having the labor force to build the housing that we need. We need housing for that labor force too. Um, Chris, you're up. Um, and sorry, just, actually, just my first question, just kind of piggyback off of what Stephanie just asked. It, it, so we're, and, and I apologize, I've only had a chance to 
read the executive summary and just skim the big report, but it, is the expectation that wages in the state are not going to rise commensurately in the time needed to pay for the now increased average median cost of homes? Is that my understanding that correctly? So we haven't projected out wages, but I will say that although wages have risen in the past few years, home prices have been rising faster. So that trend will likely continue, but we have not studied future wages. We have looked at job openings now and the wages of job openings now and what households would need to be earning um, as a total household based on those jobs in order to actually live here and stay here. So I guess the the follow-up question then to probably, I don't know if this goes to Victoria or or Greg, um, or maybe, or maybe, um, you know, Johnny, or uh, so is not to, I'm not going to do a good job of phrasing this, but, but it sounds like, you know, this is the, the, the cost of a, of a, of a house now, median cost of a house, a family needs to make at least a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? That's how many, uh, how many families can actually afford to buy a house at that price in Maine? One thing I want to clarify too, just is, you know, there are also macroeconomic factors that are causing home prices to go up. As we all know, interest rates are a huge part of why housing costs are so high, but they're not the only reason. Um, so I, I just want to acknowledge the macroeconomic factors. It's not just undersupply um, and underproduction in Maine. Um, but, you know, the median household in Maine um, makes, I think, between 76 and 78K annually. Um, so just to put that in perspective, that's pretty well below um, the affordable purchase price um, for the median home in Maine now. Okay. And Johnny, did I hear you say a second ago about about kind of the the, the chicken and the egg of the of the labor force to build the homes, and then um, are you saying are you saying that the the historic underproduction that we're dealing with is because we don't have enough people to build homes? Am I understanding that correctly? Or, or what is the root of the, the, the underproduction? I mean, I think that might be a little bit of a mischaracterization because, uh, uh, I mean, the historic causes are hard to pin down exactly. But what is true is that, uh, is that uh, main housing and contractors, uh, e everyone seems to be working pretty much at capacity, right? Contractors have huge backlog uh, backlogs of work. Uh, right now, it takes longer to get a home built uh, than, it, than it did five years ago. Um, and that is due to many factors. There are still supply chain problems that we have. You know, we're still untangling the pandemic era supply chain problems. But uh, a factor in that is that, right, a shortage of skilled labor um, in, in the, insofar as if we wanted to scale up to the production levels that, that the report is saying we need to, um, we need more uh, skilled labor. Yeah, and Chris, you know, a good illustration of that is sort of you know, two years ago when I was still trying to build housing at Avesta, there was a particular 25 unit property for older Mainers in Farmington that we were working to build. They're still working to build that. They're still trying to get it through the process but the cost of doing so has raised a full 50% in those two years. And that's what's really frustrating. A lot of that, as Johnny said, is uh, labor supply, is some supply chain issues, but that's the, one of the big challenges. I mean, I was when I was meeting with the housing committee a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the fact that from 2000 to 2018, our state invested about $65 million in affordable housing production in total over those 18 years. And you know, since the governor took office and the governor and the legislature, both sides of the aisle, have been really focused on this issue, it's been $285 million of investment in affordable housing. Again, 65 over 18 years and then 285 over five years. And part of the struggle we're having is that that 285 can't go as far because the cost of building each unit has risen so dramatically. That's enormously frustrating. And that's why uh, making sure that we have the workforce to build the housing that we need is one of the critical parts of what we're working on right now. So then I guess my last question on that front is, is, is are these goals attainable? It's a great question, Chris. I mean, 
I think that what we have going for us is a governor and a legislature. Again, th this isn't a partisan issue at this point. The legislature is working together on this with the governor, but also municipalities, really good housing practitioners on the ground. Folks are all sort of pointed in the same direction. They're rowing together on this. We have that going for us. A lot of other states do not. Um, but clearly we have a challenge in front of us that's greater than anything that we've experienced before. And so it's sort of a matter of both, you know, continuing to support successful programs that create affordable housing, but knowing that that's never going to be enough when we're talking about need this high. So much of this work is going to have to be about changing the conditions on the ground that allow the private sector to build more of the housing that we so desperately need. Um, and so you know, I all I can say is that there's a whole lot of um, energy to move forward and work on this, um, and and hopefully we'll find out in over the course of the next five to ten years that we made extraordinary progress. And just to add to that, I mean, th this is a big number. A lot of states, a lot of regions are facing really similar challenges. Um, if you think about just the historic average from 2016 to 2021, the state, you know, municipalities across the state were permitting about 4,800 units a year. Now, just because something is permitted doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be built through to completion, but just for context, you know, to meet both the historic underproduction and future need, if you think about, okay, adding to your permitting every year, or, you know, through 2030, that's about, you know, the state needs to start permitting about eight to 9,000 units a year. It's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, if you think about spreading that across the state and making some land use changes, investments, building capacity, building up the construction industry, um, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. There have been individual years where Maine has gotten closer to those numbers. Um, and so we, you know, we think about it in the report as thinking about how production needs need to need to change annually across all regions, you know, through 2030 to be able to meet this need. I wonder if I can just ask Christiana just to to, to um, clarify for everybody on the call. The the study is very clear when it talks about homes that are needed. And can you just for everybody here, because housing has its own language almost. When you when the study says home and this many homes are needed, what does that mean? Yeah. So we we like to think about all different types of homes. So single family, um, attached housing, duplexes multifamily buildings, ADUs, a home is a place for a household to live. Um, different types of homes at different sizes, locations, um, can be delivered at different price points. You know, so smaller homes generally cost less to build. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean a multifamily building. It can also mean a series of smaller single family homes or attached homes. So in the report, we really focus on, you're going to need to be delivering units across the income spectrum to meet the needs of a broad range of different types of households. In order to do that, different types of homes are gonna to need to be built. And in order to do that, municipalities need to permit a range of homes to be built. Um, and that's just such an important piece of being able to meet the housing need. It's not all gonna be done through one type of housing. I think, Hannah, I'm sorry, Nicole got you by about a tenth of a second. You'll be next. Nicole, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Nicole with, with Maine Public Radio. Um, I noticed that the report briefly talks about short-term rentals, and that's been a point of debate for a lot of municipalities in recent years and, and the state in, in general. Um, based on my kind of, you know, again, brief reading of it, it seemed as if there's sort of a mixed view of what impact short-term rentals really have on our housing stock. And, and wonder, I guess, it, um, probably to Christiana, if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah. So one thing that we found is that the demand for seasonal and short-term rental homes has been high for a really long time in Maine. It's always been a pretty significant part of Maine's housing inventory. You know, what we're seeing obviously is since the advent of Airbnb, um, VRBO and other short-term rental platforms, those are, you know, can be more easily accessible to a broader audience. But we haven't actually seen the number of seasonal homes as a share of Maine's overall housing stock go up that much over time. Um, what we found is that also when you think about, you know, there's a broad range of short-term rentals. 
Um, many of them are actually homes that probably wouldn't really be affordable to the average manor if they were otherwise available as a long-term rental. They're really big, they're really nice, they're, you know, on a big property on the water, things like that, or they're in a in a hotel or they're in some sort of other type of home. So when we what we try to do is really break it down and look at what are the homes within that inventory that are actually more comparable to naturally occurring affordable housing or what we would consider to be, you know, a, a modest uh, home that would be affordable to the average manor. And when we when we really break it down and get down to that number, it's not nearly as high. With that being said, in some communities that are much smaller, that number is a significant share of their housing stock. And for them, it is a significant issue. Um, it's, it's It has a lot to do with the scale of the community. Yeah, I, I, I do think that, you, you know, folks may remember there was a short term uh, rental commission that was created at the state level to look into these issues. And what what HR and I what HR and a found in this data and that's presented to I think really sort of tracks with where that commission went, which is that this is a, a really serious issue in some parts of the state. But when you zoom out at a statewide level, it's very hard for the state to regulate short-term rentals without doing um, unhelpful things in some places. And this is why I think the, the commission ended up going in a bit of a different direction. And uh, you're seeing more of that activity and those conversations happening at the local level. Yeah. Anna. Um, hi, I'm with the Press Herald. I have, it's probably more of a like logistical question, but the report towards the end notes um, a future like database or online dashboard for some of this housing data. Is there any sort of timeline expected for when that might be live? Greg, I can, I can take that if you want me to. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah, so so after the release of this report, report, we'll be turning to putting together um, a dashboard that will allow municipalities um, to look at their existing conditions data, look at information and indicators about housing need, um, compare themselves to other places across the state, and you'll be able to look at it at the municipal, county, um, and state level. Um, we're working with the state right now to finalize what will really go in that. Um, right now, it will be really about existing conditions in Maine. It's not going to put forth targets. Um, you know, there's, there's, as Greg mentioned, a lot of work that needs to be done to actually, um, you know, work with communities to set those targets. But it will, at the very least, allow communities to understand uh, more about their existing conditions. So we're, we're planning to get that, you know, first version up by the end of this year. Um, and yeah, we're excited to to get that out there. Can I add something uh, to tack on there? I think that's a really important takeaway on this study is that it's not just a study that's going to be put away somewhere because of the forward looking nature of it. And because of the creation of these dashboards, it's going to become a real tool that planners and developers can use, um, especially down at the municipal level to, to really get a grip on the number of units or the number of homes that are needed, what kind of homes are needed. So it's gonna be very specific to each in, uh, each locality. Um, so I think that's a really important takeaway and um, is that this isn't just a study for the sake of studying it and figuring out what we need or forecasting the weather for next week, but to really put a tool in planners and developers hands that they can use going forward. Okay, um, Zara, I think you're you uh, you beat Chris this time around. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so yeah, on that sort of forward-looking note, I was wondering about the sort of setting production targets. Um, that to me, I'm just sort of looking like how if you have anything to embellish about how this is going to be enforced at the local municipal level. Um, what strategies? Maybe um, if you want to speak to, from the governor's office perspective, Greg, um, in terms of working with local officials, I know they've opposed, um, the Maine Municipal Association opposed LD2003 uh, um, in a written testimony. And I'm just sort of wondering how you plan to work with local officials and municipalities in setting these and realizing these production targets. Because um, I know a hyper-local focus hasn't really worked out too well in the past. Yeah, that's right. And, and I do want to 
clarify here again that these are uh, an articulation of needs um, and are, are by no means something that you know are going to be foisted on localities at this point uh, in these numbers. The, the idea from here is to meet with um, municipalities, preferably as a region, understanding these labor markets and housing markets are regional, um, and talk about these and talk about what the local obstacles are to creating more housing, and together try to try to hone in on what production goals should look like. But I, I do want to be careful too to say even in that. Um, there is no structure in LD 2003 that ever says, you know, taking these goals and going to something more onerous on local communities is required. Uh, and, and I don't think that's anybody's intent at this point. The idea here is now to use this information to try to articulate mutually agreeable goals going forward. Um, and so we'll, we'll work with councils of governments, uh, municipalities, um, and and again, take this at a regional level and, and see if we can get on the same page moving forward. Greg, can you just um, just articulate, to, just so everybody knows, like where LD 2003 stands as far as an implementation timeline? Because that did change in the last legislative session. Yeah, sure. It did change. Um, the legislature um, in this past session clarified some things in the law that municipalities had raised and um, had wanted some clarity on. Um, but it also extended out the implementation date. And specifically what it did is said that for uh, municipalities that have a city council uh, kind of government, the implementation date is now January 1st, 2024. It had been for all towns, July 1st, 2023. But for those towns with uh, you know, that kind of city council government format, January 1st, for those that have a town meeting format, it's uh, July 1st of 2024. And, you know, so again, part of what um, we're really happy to see is the team at DECD getting funding out to communities as well, both on changing their ordinances and on going above and beyond LD 2003 uh, to do more and bigger things. Um, so hopefully that answers the question, but please follow up if I made any of that confusing. No, great. Thank you very much. Chris. I'm going to have to chew over that last part about the implementation date for a little bit. Um, I noticed uh, there's there's uh, it's laid out about the kind of what homes we need in the state based on income. Um, but there's also talk about uh, our population demographically in terms of their age, um, allowing people to age in place, um, but also creating affordable housing for them. I guess what I'm trying to square in my head is uh, we haven't all of these different factors that combine into why we're short on housing. So is there is there a process of like if we build more affordable housing for for people who are older, they'll move into those. They'll vacate their current units that can be uh, reinvested in if necessary and make them available to a younger demographic that could live there longer. Am I understanding that correctly or no? Um, I mean, it's complicated. I think there, there are elements of this where, you know, in order in order for households to move into new homes that meet their stage of life, whether it's because they have children, whether it's because they want to downsize, whether it's people who are, you know, first time renters in the market, the units need to be available at that size and price point in order for them to do that. When they're not, they stay in other housing longer, um, which again, kind of um, makes the whole cycle tough in terms of opening up homes for people to move through different phases of life. But, you know, for people to age in place, they really need options. For some people, that really might mean staying in the home they've been in for a long time. That might be the right thing for them. But at least to have the option to have something um, that and increase the supply of homes that would better suit that need, um, you know, it, is great for Mainers who want to, you know, age in their community, whether staying in their home or, or living somewhere else. Right now, just in general, people have very limited options. The availability rate across the housing market is so low, you know, between two and 4% across the entire market, which is well below what would be sort of a healthy rate of around 5%, which means that there just literally are not enough homes for people to move into if they need to do so for, for different reasons. So, so is that kind of where the municipalities kind of st start to come into place of 
we in our town or our city decide, boy, we really could use more 55 plus communities so we can get those people there. Or, or boy, we really need more single family homes that are you know below $300,000. Is that the point is to get the local entities to decide what they need? Yeah, exactly. There's so much variation in local need and communities are really best positioned to understand those needs and to take those broader numbers and think, okay, where, where can we accommodate growth in our community? Who are the populations that are highest need here? Um, and so we really want, you know, communities to think about these numbers and the broad income distribution, but really get down to the, to the weeds in their communities and what that means in terms of affordable housing, market rate housing, housing of different sizes, and price points. So then my Christiana, last thing, I'm, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Tony. No, Chris, if I can just, Christiana, if you could, just for the rest of the group, you, you referenced that vacant and available rate, the 2% uh, versus 5%. Can you just do a quick overview on that number? Because it is, it is pretty prevalent in the report, and I think it's an important uh, one to tease out. Yeah, and this is another, to an early question about what has changed since 2019. This is something that is really significant. Um, so when I say vacant and available homes, I literally mean homes that are for rent or for sale. So they would be available for someone to move into if they wanted or needed to move. There are a lot of other vacant homes in the state. Um, there are those that are used seasonally. There are those that are in foreclosure or are unoccupied because they need repair. Um, you know, the number of homes that's, that are sitting vacant um, because they either need a reinvestment or they're being held vacant for some reason actually has been going up. And simultaneously, the number of for sale and for rent homes, so that truly available number has been going down significantly. So the vacant homes in Maine are absorbing a lot of this new demand, but you're now in a situation where there's just really low availability in the market overall, which is, I think, something you just hear anecdotally all the time from people across the state. Um, and that that is a real just overall supply challenge where um, the supply has just not kept up with the increase of demand over the past, you know, five plus years. Sorry, right, Chris, I, I interrupted you, but I, I thought it was a good point to kind of tease out. No, definitely. And hopefully this is really simple. And I'm sorry for missing this. When you talked about the implementation points for those municipalities, depending on whether their their, their government structure is, it's it's the implementation of the dashboard. Or did I miss? I, I think I missed it. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. The implement, implementation date I'm talking about is when they have to have local ordinances in place to comply with LD 2003. All right, we got about five minutes left. Um, open to anything else? Okay, Nicole. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is, I guess, kind of a, a big picture question, but I wonder if, um, I, I wonder if you think that municipalities are kind of make have to date made the connection between their housing stock and the workforce aspect of, of things. I mean, I, I know we have, you know, plenty of examples of different towns that are doing kind of unique things. They're, they're trying um, new things when it comes to building housing. But I, I feel like this report kind of paints in pretty stark terms sort of the implications of, of not building and especially implications for our workforce. So I, I wonder if maybe maybe that's a question for Greg or um, Victoria, if, if you feel like that message has been made to date and if you're, you're, you know, thinking that this report will maybe turn that thinking around if you think it does. I, I want to give Victoria a, a shot first to. You... Yeah, I mean, I think um, we, I think the, the study really identifies this need for housing in all geographies, many income levels, all those things. And we know that in order to continue growing Maine's economy, which has been growing, continues to grow, we need to be able to attract folks to the state to increase our workforce. And, and we have more people working in Maine's economy now than we ever have. Um, but another key element to that is to ensuring that there's appropriate housing stock available. So Greg, with that, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Nicole, I, I guess I feel like the answer to your question from my perspective is it, it's been a, a little uneven um, across municipalities in terms of how they internalize the connection here. 
Um, but I, I do think that what this report offers is a chance to zoom out a bit um, as a state to understand kind of the implications for us all, you know, and then it's sort of when you when you zoom back in and then say, OK, how about in my town? Are we willing to create the homes that we need? I, we're hoping that this changes the conversation a bit. I have to say, watching the conversation evolve around LD 2003 gives me optimism. Certainly every time this issue is now brought up to like the housing committee or others, it's it's rare now that I, I kind of hear uh, municipalities really opposing the concept that we need to build more housing if we want our state to, to progress economically. Certainly it happens sometimes, but it, it is clearly more the exception than the rule. Um, and that makes me optimistic about how we move forward. Just add that uh, that labor markets are regional uh, in general, depending on on the trade. But uh, but labor markets are regional, so it, I think it's a, a an understandable thing for for local municipality governance to kind of overlook the aspect that you're asking about there, there, Nicole. And and so the report does a good job of you know like highlighting why that's important. And then, you know, so there, there are aspects to resolving uh, the, our housing issues that are both regional and very local when it comes to the type of housing that, that works for each community. Um, and so I guess uh, what I'm trying to say is, is we're, we're hoping the report helps close some of that, that gap in, in discussion. All right, I think we're at time, folks. Any last questions on the report? Anything else that needs to be clarified in advance? Happy to i um, happy to do it while we're all here. Hope this was helpful. It's a big report. It's a lot of, and, and it has a lot of, um, I know I spent a fair amount of time with it over the last couple of weeks, really internalizing my own sense of what housing means. So I hope, um, hope this was helpful for everybody because it is uh, a lot of conversation. Stephanie. Hey, last thing is um, I didn't know if environmentally speaking, if there was a consideration for the impact, maybe all this housing and the building um, of all these properties would have on Maine. I know a lot of Mainers are very environmentally conscious. Um, I know we've had developments in places like Lake Auburn proposed and in York, uh, but I've also met a lot of Mainers who don't want to want any more homes built. So I didn't, I didn't know if, if there's a discussion to be had there. I'll, I'll speak to a couple of things. I mean, so when regions are not building enough housing to meet their job growth, that means that people are going to commute longer to get to their jobs. And aligning your housing production with economic growth is actually essential to promoting sustainability um, and allowing people to live close to their work um, and not um, sort of spreading development out um, across you know, a large area. We know that greater density is more sustainable. We know that it reduces commute times. There are a lot of environmental benefits to really strategically planning um, for housing to allow people to live closer to where they work and to increase density, even if it's modestly in some places. But then, of course, there are really you know, important environmental considerations that have to be part of this local and regional planning and implementation process that we've been talking about. This study doesn't focus on that because it's really about, you know, as as they mentioned, taking a step back and, and looking at the overall need for homes. But, you know, planning for housing to meet growth is inherently a, a sustainable strategy um, to support your economy. You know, you say that too, Christiana, and you reminded me because there was a question earlier about was there anything in here that surprised us? And obviously the top line number is, is a big number. But I believe in your report, you found Maine had the single largest commute it in does. the country, uh, which is one of the things that surprised me too. Is that that's right? Yeah, Mainers commute the furthest um, of any state in the country to get to their jobs. And so you know, that's something that we was really central to thinking about how homes can support um, the economy. As right. someone who moved here from California, I'll just comment that distance is not always equal to uh, travel time. <laughs> that's, that's true. I think that's one of the reasons to traffic is not that. So Mainers are willing to put up with it. 
We're probably number one in podcast listening in the nation too, most likely. <laughs> um, all right, folks, anything else? Last question. I mean, what, you could, if there's something that comes up before tomorrow, um, send an email to Victoria Scott and I. We'll see if we can get you a response or something regarding the report. But um, I appreciate everyone's time today and, and thoughtfulness in going through this. For, for Scott's sake, I'll just remind it, the embargo lifts at one o'clock in the morning, which is just an opportunity to get stories and um, filed today and out in the morning for everything. And again, um, Scott, your affordable housing conference starts in the morning, correct? Do you want to tell people a little bit about, about that? I'm not sure uh, all the details on timing. Yeah, the conference starts tomorrow. You, you're all welcome to come and attend and attend any of the sessions. We have a range, <clears throat> we have a big range of sessions, um, including some really prominent keynote speakers that are going to come in. Um, I think you're going to find a lot there that you'll be interested in, especially the folks that are focusing on housing or folks that are uh, focusing in on the uh, homelessness response system. All of that is on the agenda tomorrow. Um, you're all welcome. You just need to check in at the desk and you will be uh, granted entry into the into the conference. What time does it start, Scott? Na uh, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Holiday Inn by the Bay, right? Yeah. Okay. Holiday Inn by the Bay. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, you, there's there's you, you'll um, there, there's all the information on the conference and the full agenda is on our website, too, at mainhousing.org. All right. Everybody, thank you very, very much. Any other questions before the end of the day? Just uh, give us a shout. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks thank all. you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.